Namaste. So, your Mohini Miss is back to teach you history. And today I would like to highlight on the fourth chapter the early stages of collective action. But before I start, I would like to pray to be connected to God. Oh God, open my eyes to the needs of my children. Help me so that I can pour out your love, your mercy and your comfort on my children. So, as I told you, the fourth chapter is early stages of collective action. And in this chapter, I will explain you first the meaning of collective action. So what does collective action mean? Collect collection, collective action means when a group of people work unitedly to achieve their goal, to achieve the end that is known as collective action. And this collective action was taken during the time of revolt of 1857. So I will highlight the revolt of 1857. United we stand goes the proverbial phrase. So it was the rich and the high class people of the society influenced by Western education who took such initiative. Gradually, this term became known even to the common people and it was these people who took initiative and protested against the injustices of the British, superstitions of the medieval India and tried to promote nationalism, feeling of love for one's country. So, you know that the British became powerful in Bengal after the Battle of Plassey, which took place on 1757. And the British became powerful in India after that, and they ruled in India for almost 200 years. And so, from 1757 till 1857, that is exactly 100 years after the British established their hold in India. There was a lot of discontent, there was a lot of dissatisfaction among the people of India. And it is said that the Indian people revolted 54 times against the British. From 1757 to 1857, they revolted 54 times. And these revolts were local in nature. It was not a very united movement. So it was easy for the British to quail the revolt, to stop the revolt with the help of the army. But the revolt of 1857 was a very big revolt. It was larger in magnitude and it involved the whole of India. And it was not a sudden incident. The discontent had been accumulating in the minds of the Indians for a long period. And this discontent, it bursted out in flames in the revolt of 1857. So this is how the, this is about the revolt. Then the British wanted to establish a good relation with the army, with the sepoys. They wanted to pacify the sepoys and the uh, and at the time, it was the uh, army, it was a sepoy in the regiment of Barakpur that when army revolted, his name is Mangal Pandey. And Mangal Pandey revolted against the British on 29th of March, 1857. And after the revolt, Mangal Pandey was, was um, uh, killed by the British. Then the revolt from Barakpur spread to uh, it spread to Ambala. 
then it spread to uh, Lucknow, then it sparked off in Meerut. And in Meerut, it sparked off on 10th of May 1857. So, so this is how the revolt started. So actually the revolt started from Meerut on 10th of May 1857. And what did the people, what did the rebels do in Meerut? In Meerut, they broke the prison and they released the prisoners. And after that, they marched towards Delhi and they captured Delhi and they proclaimed Badur Shah Zafar, Badur Shah II, the last Mughal emperor, as the em emperor of India. And at that time, there were many rebel leaders who fought in the revolt of 1857. They are, one is Nana Sahib, who was the adopted son of Peshwa Bajirao and he was denied the pension by the British. So in Kanpur, Nana Sahib fought against the British and his end, we don't know what happened to him. He escaped into the jungles of Nepal and his end is not known. And in his army, there was a, in his military, there was one uh, military commander, Tantia Tope. And it was Tantia Tope who revolted in central part of India and Tantia Tope was killed. Then in Jhansi, Rani Lakshmi Bai revolted and she was killed on 17th of June 1857 and uh, Kuar Singh revolted in Bihar. He also was killed. He was known as the tiger of the revolt and this is how the rebel leaders were all killed and slowly the British, they capture Delhi by the middle of September and after capturing Delhi they captured the two sons of Badur Shah, killed them and then the uh, Badur Shah was exiled to Yangon in Burma and after that the British held their sway in the whole of India. So this is how the revolt of 1857 took place. Then so I finished about the revolt of 1857. What is the revolt of 1857? How it started? Then the next that I'm going to deal is the nature and characteristics of the revolt. Nature and the characteristics of the revolt. So there are two different opinions regarding the nature of the revolt. There are two historians. Historians divide into two parts. One group of historians say it was a sepoy mutiny because it started with the sepoys and ended with the sepoys and the other group of historians say that it was a war of independence. So those historians who say that it was a sepoy mutiny are historians like uh, John Lawrence and the Bengali educated people like Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Ishwar Chandra uh, Gupta. Uh, Dinabandhu Mitra, they were the ones who said that it was only a sepoy mutiny because it started with the sepoys and ended with the sepoys. But there are other group of historians like Disraeli, Mellison, Alexander Doe, um, uh, V.A. Smith, they say that although the revolt started with the sepoys, but there was a national sentiment and that is the people of India wanted to remove the British, oust the British from India and they wanted to make Badur Shah as the emperor of India. And historians like V.D. Savarkar, he has written a book, Indian War of Independence. And in this book, Indian War of Independence, he says that the revolt was a national revolt, whereas Historians like R.C. Majumdar, who wrote the history of freedom movement, he says that it was not a national revolt. He says that it was only the, the revolt of the sepoys. He says that it was not a national revolt because he says that at that time, the feeling of nationalism had not developed among the people of India. People of India did not know what is nationalism. So that is why he does not want to call this revolt as a national revolt. But there are other historians, there are other historians and historians like Subhasan Shen, he says that it was a national revolt because he says that it started with the sepoys, but the common people also joined the revolt. And what did the common people do? 
the common people especially in northern part of india in the northern part of india the common people took up traditional weapons like bows arrows sickles axes and then they revolted against the british and it is said that british reg uh, residents british courts british institutions british factories were the targets of their attack so according to subhashan sen it was a national revolt and in this revolt it is said that both the hindus and the muslims united to fight the revolt and according to azamgarh proclamation of 25th of august 1857 it is said that both the hindus and muslim people were ruined they were destroyed by the by the british rule and according to the imam commission of lord dalhousie it is said that the properties of both the hindus and the muslims were confiscated it was taken away by the british and another very important event is that there that led to the unity of the hindus and the muslims and the main reason for the unity of the hindus and muslim was the cartridge affair the british had introduced the enfield rifle and in this enfield rifle it is said that the bullet had to be loaded into the into the rifle and before loading it the bullet had to be torn with the teeth so there was a rumor that the bullet was made of fat of pig and cow and in the army mostly the hindus and muslims were the were the were the sepoys and so it was a kind of insult for both the hindus and the muslims because muslims don't eat pig they regard it as regard it as unclean and the hindus they don't eat beef so that is why it was a kind of uh, uh, an attack on their river, uh, on their on their religion so that is why both the hindus and muslims united and historians like tori selly says that it was a national revolt he says it that it was a national revolt because he said that the people wanted to establish political uh, they wanted to you know they they wanted to um, they wanted to uh, modify the the political structure and they wanted to establish national government so the tori selly says that it was a national revolt and historians like uh, ranajit goa who is the historian of subaltern studies subaltern means common people he has written history on common people and historians like ranajit goa says that it was a national revolt because the common people the 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 sepoys started common people also joined and as they joined the feeling of nationalism feeling of patriotism unity naturally develop so according to many historians it is a war of independence and according to many historians it is the sepoy mutiny but ultimately you have to say that though it started with the sepoys but it was the first war of independence and i personally feel that this particular topic nature and characteristics of the revolt is very important this year and it comes for 8 marks so this is about the nature and characteristics of the revolt and i hope i am able to i am able to make it clear to you so the next uh, topic that i'll be dealing is about the failure of the revolt failure of the revolt and it is said that this revolt failed and the main reason why it failed is because there was no proper plan in order to start anything you should have a proper plan so they didn't have a proper plan there was no coordination among the leaders they didn't work together there was no unity among the leaders and another uh, next point is that uh, the leaders were leaders only in the particular local area like for instance rani lakshmi bai was lead was the leader only in jhansi kuwar singh was leader only in bihar so that way they were leader only in their own local area they were not the leaders of the whole of india so that is why the revolt failed and another reason why the revolt failed is because there was no political ideal as to what sort of government they would establish after removing the british from india and the last reason 
for the failure of the revolt is because the Indians fought with very traditional weapons. I told you like axes, bows, arrows, whereas the British fought with machine guns. So they could not come in comparison in any way with the British. As a result, the revolt of 1857 failed. So this is about the failure of the revolt. Then. The next thing I will be doing is about the attitude of the educated Bengali society towards the revolt. Attitude. What was the attitude? Did they support the revolt? Did the educated Bengali people, middle class people, did they support the revolt? So that we are going to, I'm going to highlight. So it is said that the educated middle class people were very apathetic. Apathetic means they did not support the revolt. They were not at all sympathetic to the revolt of 1857. The reason being that they felt that if they support the revolt, then medieval feudalism or medieval age will start in India. So they did not want medieval feudalism to start in India in place of you know western education they wanted western education to be introduced they wanted reforms to take place and not feudalism so that is why they protest they sup didn't support the revolt and uh, these educated middle class people they felt they, they felt that uh, you know uh, the british rule is like a blessing for them it was a blessing for them and they paid a lot of homage and respect to the, to the British government. And Ishwar Chandra Gupta, he hated the rebel leaders. He hated Kuwar Singh, he hated Rani Lakshmi Bai and all the rebel leaders. And it is said that the icons of the so-called educated, uh, educated people of the Bengali society, like Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Ishwar, uh, Ishwar uh, Chandra Gupta, uh, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, they all did not support the revolt. I told you they considered it as a, the, they considered the British rule as a, as a blessing. And um, there, is a, there is a writer, his name is Durga, Durga Das Banerjee. He wrote Bengali, Bid, uh, Bengali Bidrohi, or Bidrohi Bengali. And in this book, he I mean, in this book, he has uh, underestimated the sepoys. That means he had a very low opinion about the sepoys. And the father of Indian nationalism, like Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee is known as the father of Indian nationalism. He also said that the sepoys were like epidemic. They were like disease for the whole of India. And they wanted the continuance of the British rule. They wanted the British rule to continue and they wanted to support the British rule. And historians like, historians like uh, Ishwar Chandra Gupta, uh, who wrote Sambat Prabhakar, he said that the British were very arrogant. The Brit uh, I mean, not British, sorry, I'm sorry. The sepoys were very, very, the, uh, the sepoys were very arrogant. They were unloyal. They were ungrateful and, um, you know, and people like Gauri Shankar Bhattacharya, who wrote the journal Sambad, Sambad Bhaskar, he advised the people to dance with joy, to dance with joy at the failure of the revolt. So, and there was even another, uh, you know, person, uh, another writer, and his name is, his name is uh, Pras uh, uh, Kali Prasanna Sen. And Kali Prasanna Sen was the, was the person who prayed for the destruction of the sepoys. So as a result, you can see here that the middle class people did not support, the middle class people did not support the revolt of 1857. So they were apathetic, they were not sympathetic to the revolt and this is how you know they did not support the revolt. So this is about the attitude of the, uh, of the, uh, of the educated Bengali people but um, and this is uh, actually question come from here but this question came this year. 
this attitude of the Bengali uh, people towards the revolt. This came this year, but you should remember the different authors, the opinion, what they said against the revolt of 1857. Then the next thing that I will be dealing is about the Queen's proclamation. So what is proclamation? Proclamation is an announcement. So after the revolt came to an end, then the British passed an act known as Act for the Better Government of India on 2nd of 2nd of August 1858 and in this proclamation what did they do is that they abolished the East India Company. The East India Company came to an end and it came to an end so this East India Company was ruling in India since 1600 Queen uh, Elizabeth had given permission to the to the trading company to you know to uh, trade in India and since then till the revolt of 1857 this uh, East India Company was ruling over India so the East India Company was abolished and now the Viceroy's rule started so it was the Viceroy who was going to rule and the first Viceroy at that time was um, Lord Canning Lord Canning was the first Viceroy of India and um, what did he do he called a meeting in Allahabad on behalf of Queen Victoria and after calling the meeting he on 1st of November 1858 he made an announcement on behalf of Queen Victoria and this announcement was known as the Queen's Proclamation and in this Queen's Proclamation it was said that they will abolish the doctrine of lapse that means Indians can Indians can, uh, you know, adopt heirs. They have the right to adopt. Another British will not follow the policy of territorial expansion. They will not expand in India. They will not, you know, occupy any territory. They will allow people to retain their title, like, uh, like the Peshwa, like the rulers of Maharashtra had taken the title of Peshwa. So they said they can retain the title. They can keep the title. They will not abolish the title. Then uh, they said they will give jobs to the people of India according to the qualification and another is they said that um, uh, not only jobs but they said that they will treat everyone equally irrespective of race creed you know color they will treat everyone everyone equally and uh, another thing they said that they will give importance to the treaties that were signed during the time with the company or with anyone so these were the promises made in the queen's proclamation but the promises were not fulfilled actually why the british made the promise they made the promise just to pacify and establish peace with the indians and they wanted to establish the political hold in india and once they were able to establish the political hold in india then they would forget about the promise so that is why bipin chandra pal has called this proclamation as a political bluff it is a bluff of the British and it is also called the false promise. This, and despite all these, the uh, British called one uh, meeting in Delhi. It was called the Delhi Darwar and it was in the Delhi Darwar that in 1877 uh, that Queen Victoria became the Empress of India. Queen Victoria became the Empress of India on 1st Jan 18. January 1877. So this is how the British slowly from the Battle of Plassey they became powerful in the whole of India and they established their sway in the whole of India. So this is about the revolt of 1857. Then the next is about the about the associations, the age of associations. So, as I told you in the last class also, that if you want to be updated, if you want to be intelligent, you have to read books. And you have to associate with intelligent people. So, it was at this time that the intelligent people 
not only wrote books, but they also formed many associations. In order to voice the grievances of the people, in order to voice the opinion of the people, the associations were formed. So now I will do the age of associations. So, before, in the 19th century, as today, there were no political parties. So, since there were no political parties, it was the associations that used to voice the opinion of the people. They used to help in the spreading of political consciousness, political unity among the people of India. And many associations were formed in the 19th century. That is why Anil Seal, Anil Seal has, Anil Seal has written a book, Emergence of Indian Nationalism. And it was in this emergence of Indian nationalism that Anil Seal has called the 19th century as the age of associations. And associations like the Pune Sarvajanik Sabha was formed in 1867 by Gopal Hari Deshmukh. The Madras, uh, the Madras uh, Mahajan Sabha was formed in 1884. In 1884, the Madras Mahajan Sabha, then the Bangabasha Prakashika Sabha was formed in 1836, then the Indian Association, uh, the Indian Association was formed in 1878. So many associations were formed. So that is why the 19th century is known as the Age of Associations. And now I will deal with Bangabasha Prakashika Sabha, which is regarded as the first political association, not only in Bengal but in the whole of. India and it was formed in 1836. Banga Bhasa Prakashika Sabha formed in 18, 1836. And so this association was formed and it was formed by Dwarkanath Tagore and, and uh, Kalinath Roy Chaudhary were the two people who formed the Banga Bhasa Prakashika Sabha and the uh, the secretary of this association was was Gauri Shankar uh, was uh, was uh, this person uh, Gauri Shankar Bhattacharya was the secretary of this association and this association decided to meet every Thursday they decided to deal about social political religious matters and the main reason for the formation of the Banga Bhasa Prakashika Sabha is they wanted to protest against the levying of tax by the British government on rent-free lands. So they protested against the levying of tax by the British government and it was at this time there was one government employee, he was called Ram Lochan Ghosh and it was this Ram Lochan Ghosh it was this Ram Lochan Ghosh, a government employee, who wrote a letter to the secretary of the Bangabasha Prakashika Sabha, supporting the claims of the government to collect the tax. So, the members of the Bangabasha Prakashika Sabha, they called a meeting and they said that, you know, being a government employee, Ram Lochan Ghosh has the right to speak in favor of the British government. But they said that they will call a meeting next time and they will, about four to five thousand people will sign in that petition and they will request the British government not to levy tax on, on the land, especially on rent-free land. So this was decided in the meeting, but we don't know whether the meeting was really called or not because there is no record about it, we have no information about it, but we know Ultimately, that this Bangabasa Prakashika Sabha failed and it failed because there was no unity and uh, despite its failure, but this Bangabasa Prakashika Sabha helped in the formation of associations in years to come. So, that is one association. Then, the associ next association was the Zamindari Association and it was formed in 1837. And in this association, also again, it was Dwarkanath Tagore who, who formed it along with Radhakanta Dev. And Radhakanta Dev was the secretary of this Zamindari association. And this association was formed in the premises of the Hindu college. 
and at that time they decided to make the rules and regulations and according to the rules and regulations they decided that um, anyone having love for the country can become the member of the zamindari association and the subscription fee at the beginning was 5 rupees later on it increased to 20 and the meeting would be held after every 3 months and uh, and there was a committee formed by 12 members and these 12 members would look into the working of the association and the main reason for the formation of zamindari association was to promote the interest of the of the zamindars then in 1839 this zamindari association was transformed into land holders society and the land holders society also made some they you uh, know gave importance to some uh, 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 some points and that is they for the first time they taught the people to fight constitutionally that is peacefully and logically for their rights and it helped the people to voice their opinion it uh, uh, protected the interest of the zamindars and this association brought the british and the zamindars on equal footing that means the zamindars and the british were regarded as equal they were regarded as equal so this is about the landholder society and next year in 1839 uh, in 1839 in london a friend of rajaram mohan roy he was called william adams he formed one association british india society and this british india society worked in collaboration with the landholders with the landholders society it worked with the landholders society and it tried to ameliorate or to reduce the grievances of the people of india especially the zamindars so this is about the zamindari association so i think i will i will uh, uh, stop here and uh, what i would like to tell you is that uh, you know uh, that uh, be happy don't be depressed we are the, the lockdown has been extended so be happy don't be depressed so we'll meet again in the next class